What's up, everybody? Namaste. I'm sitting here on my floor in my theater room slash video game room, ready to talk some football with you with Sigmund Bloom at Cecil Lammy. And Bloom, football is back. We have a game on. It's behind me. I don't know if I can show it or not on YouTube Hangout, but we have football. It is back right now. Ravens and Bears. Hello. Hello, football. Uh, no more football this weekend until next year. That's wonderful. And it's been a wonderful time the last week, week and a half. Thanks, everybody, for letting me spread my wings a little bit and, and do some vacation. I feel I feel like my brain is still on vacation, so I decided to dress for vacation. But the fire hose of training camp news and what we try to do for you, for ourselves and our fantasy teams and prospects, sorting through this, figuring out what's meaningful, what we can ignore, uh, that's the task. And also always keeping our minds in that uh, flexible, very open to new realities. The big new reality unveil is still not for over a month, but we're getting hints at those new realities already out of camp. Hints to the new realities and not a lot yet tonight in the game bloom because we're all just waiting for Lamar Jackson. Can, can you feel it? Can yeah. you feel like all of us like, yeah, yeah, RG3, that's nice. And there was I'm a not waiting for him. I just, I just watched him and, and the Ravens. I'm, I'm behind you, Seath. <laughs> yeah, I got the screen behind me, so apologies, Bloom. Well, what are we seeing then? If we're all waiting for Lamar Jackson, well, he uh, threw a, what are we seeing so far? He threw a touchdown pass uh, to the long-haired Hayden Hurst, I believe. Um, or maybe it wasn't Mark Andrews. Anyway, uh, and I've got the TV over my shoulder, uh, too, so it's hard for me. But I know that he pulled the ball down and ran a few times. Uh, right. I know that he has a connection, a little bit of a connection going so far with Jordan Lasley. And, uh, you know, he also airmailed one over Hayden Hurst. It's early. It's really early. But uh, I thought it was funny that they didn't put him out there until after Josh Woodrum, I think. Um, it's been a fun game to watch just to get used to football again. And Robert Griffin III looks competent uh, with Marty Morningweg and James Urban. Remember what they did with Michael Vick? Um, Chase Daniel looks... Like he should be a assistant coach right now. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably where his future lies. So we're going to kind of keep an eye, keep tabs on. I may turn around from time to time just to see what's going on there. Um, but let's talk some football and let's get into Eric Decker signing with the Patriots. Is this immediately insert our Jordan Matthews take, but just change the name and barely change the game to one Eric Decker. If Decker can still play, but why was there so little interest in him? If so, I did compare Eric Decker to uh, Jordan Matthews to Eric Decker in a best case scenario when he was coming out of Vanderbilt. So it was a big slot. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Decker, you can speak to this cease from your time with him in Denver. I think he's got the football smarts to be able to pick up the, the Patriot system pretty quickly. So there's a chance, but there's also Riley McCarron. There's also Braxton Berrios. There's also Philip Dorsett lining up inside sometimes. Uh, so I'm not sure that I'm going out and drafting Decker or even picking him up, but I'm open to it. Just like I'm open to anybody who can make the Patriots roster and get snaps at wide receiver having fantasy value. Yeah, and when Julian Edelman's out and Eric Decker's in, that could lead to great things. I just wonder if he still does every interview in the nude. True story, Eric Decker. Yeah. Never wore clothes uh, in the locker room. I, I, heard, I believe you told me his nickname once, but we can't repeat that on the air. Uh, his wife said his nickname, and uh, let's just say Eric Decker's blessed <laughs> beyond belief. So there we go. As the show gets weird, we're like five seconds in and uh, already going there. But yeah, let's let's go there, and let's look at Tom Brady. Now, spoiler alert, we did the preseason watch list for the Patriots, and you're not as maybe – high on Brady as some, not, not to say that you're not high on Tom Brady, but let's talk about uh, this Patriots team and this backfield, how it could be maybe different than people expect. Well, look, Brady has fallen off at the end of the year for a few years running now, but last year he wasn't really much help to our fantasy teams in December. Uh, without Brandon Cooks, that compresses things. Um, I, I will be happily drafting Rob Gronkowski, but there's a doomsday scenario for Tom Brady's fantasy value. That is, if Gronkowski misses a significant amount of time. No Julian Edelman for the first four games, including the game against Jacksonville. I just think that Brady among the elite, I'm not taking Brady over 
Wilson. I mean, well, maybe not Wilson. That's about where the debate comes in is Brady versus Wilson because, well, how do you feel about Seattle? But not over Wentz, not over Newton, not over, of course, Rodgers or Watson. And then when you start to look at the quarterbacks you can take after Brady at a discount who might perform at or even above the level of Tom Brady, it just makes it hard for me to picture a scenario where he's one of the most profitable right answers. There can be a lot of right answers at quarterback, but some of the rewards will be small, and I think Brady fits into that category. Sigmund Gorgeous Bloom is what they're calling you in the chat room right now. Mm. Carl said that. I think it was Jared was like, oh, my God, look at Bloom's shirt. Yeah. So. We're already off and rolling. I kind of like the change up, man. And I kind of wanted to be by the TV and, and not in the studio slash uh, drafting table. I think I have everything in, in that other room here. Uh, so we are live. It is the Audible Live. We're taking your questions from the chat room as well. Cecil Lammy, Sigmund Bloom. Matt may jump in tonight as well. Uh, good news, everybody. If you've checked me out on Twitter or on Facebook, you know my fantasy football draft party coming up at the end of August. Now with more Matt Waldman. So Matt Waldman going to fly to the Mile High City. And where the event's at, Bloom, is like about two minutes from where his dad lives. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. That's in the cradle and the silver. No, I'm just... Yeah, there we go. Uh, we'll do some more singing uh, tonight as well. Looking around, the rest of the news from the National Football League Well, we've got something to talk about with what's going on with the Tennessee Titans. Uh, When you look at people looking at Derrick Henry, Deion Lewis, again, average draft position for both of these guys is maybe a little bit off and a little bit different than it should be. Now, I made no bones about it in the preseason watch list. I love Matt LaFleur. I love their new offensive coordinator. I know guys that played for him, uh, either as, you know, offensive linemen or skill position players. So, uh, you have a guy that can be creative. How does it shake out in your eyes with Deion Lewis currently at running back 28? Is that actually a little light? And is Derrick Henry a little bit too high at running back 18? I think so. Although Henry has been the subject of a lot of good reports. There's also some reports, and you love Matt LaFleur. I think this team was lowest, 32nd out of 32 teams in running back targets last year. That'll change this year. Deion Lewis is an outstanding receiver out of the backfield, but he can run between the tackles. I would expect this to be something close to a 50-50 split. I think you want to start Henry in the weeks when they're going to win, and he's going to get to do those boa constrictor carries at the end of the game that often end up with a 70-yard touchdown to finish the game. And if Matt LaFleur is good and they lost Jonathan Cyprian, we'll see which they're fighting for. So many great safeties. I don't understand why there's so many safeties in free agency. But if there's a position where you're going to lose somebody and you need to go to the street, actually – Safety is the position this year. So they're going to get to trial guys like Kenny Vaccaro and Eric Reed. Uh, if the Titans take that step forward, and the AFC South is a really interesting division this year, and Henry gets to finish out games, then Fe- Henry will end up being the better pick. But I would expect it to be closer to 50-50 during the game. I would expect it to be Deion Lewis in hurry up. I would expect it to be Deion Lewis in the passing game. And I would expect by what they pay Deion Lewis that – He's going to be a co-lead back. Uh, he just has to stay healthy. And if he does that, then in PPR leagues, he should outproduce Henry. However, if Matt LaFleur and Marcus Mariota click, if Jack Conklin comes back healthy, you no know, Taylor Luan and the holdout was no big deal, then this offense could take that Rams type leap. It's possible LaFleur was there last year. And then the whole pie gets bigger, and both Henry and Lewis end up being good picks. Maybe not to Alvin Kamara, Mark Ingram levels where they're both worth, I don't know if Ingram was worth a first round pick, but a second round pick last year after Adrian Peterson was traded. Maybe they're both worth third round picks. That's possible. If you like Tennessee, I think we talk about this a lot on the preseason watch list. When you're taking a player, you're putting a chip on that offense. Tennessee is a good offense to put chips on this year. Yeah, and it's good offense and good creativity coming. And by the way, Bloom, I get this right. Our man, Teron Davenport, is now covering. covering the Titans. Yeah, yeah awesome for you Cameron, Cameron Wolf, Howling with the Wolf, that's my guy. I used to cover the Broncos. He's actually going to cover the Dolphins. Uh, and that left the spot open. Teron, uh, congratulations, because uh, that's one of the hardest working dudes in what we do in show business. So the Audible Live looking at what's going on in current drafts right now, are people right about Christian McCaffrey and that split? Yes, with C.J. Anderson, we're a matter of 10 minutes in the show. 
and I'm talking about my old bowling partner. Uh, but with Christian McCaffrey at running back 12 in PPR, is that a touch too rich for your taste? It is. And I'm even trying to trade Christian McCaffrey in one of my dynasty leagues right now. And I, I don't have anything against Christian McCaffrey, but as things are starting to settle in, I wonder if his role is basically destined to be about what it was in his rookie year. I don't know that he's ever going to be the best between the tackles runner on his team. When there are players like CJ Anderson available in free agency, and I would rather, I mean, see, if it's third and one and we need to get that one yard, it's not Christian McCaffrey, right? I mean, maybe it's Cam Newton. It, yeah. Um, um, it, short yardage in the red zone. It's not going to be Christian McCaffrey. And even though he was very productive as a receiver last year, how much of that was by default? When you add DJ Moore, when you add Greg Olson back to the offense, Devin Funches will be healthier. You got Curtis Samuel. You got Tory Smith. Um, does he get as many targets? Is that really one of the most productive plays? Is Norv Turner, and this is temporary, but is Norv Turner the kind of offensive mind that's going to get the most out of a talent like McCaffrey? I just don't see it coming. So I won't be surprised if McCaffrey levels off. And folks will look at McCaffrey's finish last year in PPR leagues as the number 10 or 11 or 12 running back. But if you actually look at him on a game-by-game -game basis, he was outside of the top 25 as often as he was inside of the top 15. It's not a running back you take in the third round, not unless you think it's going to grow his role, his production. They can say 20, 25 touches a game, but rational coaching to me dictates that 200 carries should go to C.J. Anderson. And as Ari Engel, FF Esquire from Football Guys Staff, has been pointing out, and Cece, you can speak to this, C.J. Anderson is an excellent, excellent pass blocker. And when you have plays where you might be needing the running back to block on a passing play, actually, Anderson might be the better fit than McCaffrey. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how those guys are used this year with the Carolina Panthers. And just know that if you want McCaffrey, you're going to pay a hefty price. So the chat room is naming your shirt, Bloom. And this is why you watch the show, youtube.com slash footballguysdotcom. Just quickly, uh, Tropically Terrific, Maui Wowie, and Maui Tropical Wowie. Tropic Blunder might be my favorite. Maui oh, Wowie might be your favorite, Blunder. Bloom. But I mean, Maui Wowie is, how could I ever say no to Maui Wowie? But Tropic Blunder, I've got to give credit uh, on that one. It's a great film, by the way. Uh, this is fantastic. I, I, I almost think at this point, we should just turn the show into an ongoing conversation with the chat room. Well, and how about an AMA, right? Because we got football mm -hmm. on and we're going through the news. We're doing preseason watch list right now. So that's always on my mind. And thank you guys for listening on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and all that. This is interesting. Nicholas comes in and, and I got one, a question about drum beats. So chat room, keep firing your questions. But Nicholas says, do you prefer Traquan Smith or Cameron Meredith in New Orleans? Well, I can't, I can't say exactly um, how... This information came to my uh, awareness, but there are a lot of people around that team that think Traquan Smith is actually the number two. And there are a lot of people around that team in that building, and I'll tell you what it is, Bloom, a little bit later, um, that actually are lining up Traquan Smith to be that second target uh, with Michael Thomas there. We know Biggity Ben Watson, right? We'll talk about Alvin Kamara catching passes out of the backfield. But I love, because I was going to talk about this tonight and the information that I got this week, uh, but Nicholas comes through with a question about Traquan Smith or Cameron Meredith. Had you asked me 24 hours ago, I could you make that argument for Meredith being that he's healthy, but Bloom, I'm telling you, in the building, Traquan Smith is blowing it up. And I can read you some of the quotes that I got, but uh, it's simply fantastic. Let's talk a little Traquan Smith or Cameron Meredith. Well, in redraft right now, I would probably go with Cameron Meredith. Uh, but you bring up some good points. I'll say this. When I watch Traquan Smith on the UCF film preparing for the draft this year, with the exception of, and I shouldn't yada, yada, yada this, with the exception of that occasional drop, inexplicable drop, he didn't look as a downfield weapon that different than DJ Moore. Maybe he wasn't quite the same after the catch as DJ Moore, but I think... He, you watch them and you see a lot of the same attributes. Okay. And we also know that the saints, when they take a skill player on the second day of the draft, you pay attention. Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas, Jimmy Graham, you pay attention. So they know the fit. They have a plan. 
I like Cameron Meredith a little better for redraft this year because I would imagine that Ted Ginn's going to still get a lot of outside snaps. He can still fly. He can still add that element that they want. Come next year, if Ted Ginn's not part of the team, then maybe that's when Trey Quan Smith really takes off. Now, Cameron Meredith has a nice fit in that Marcus Colston role. But when Marcus Colston was on the Saints, there wasn't a Michael Thomas and there wasn't a Kamara Ingram type backfield. And there's a lot to shake out here. Both Meredith and Smith are solid, solid fits, great plays. And then, of course, if we're really looking at a long view, how much longer is Drew Brees there? Two, three years until Taysom Smith takes over. Taysom Smith, Taysom Hill takes over. Right. But I would say that there's still a lot of time for this to shake out. And based on the prices right now in dynasty leagues, I'd rather have Smith uh, in redraft leagues. I'd rather have Meredith, but I would guess at different points during the season, both Meredith and Smith will have their big games. Last pick in my draft and bloom. You said it earlier. You're putting a chip on the offense. I want my chips on the saints, right? Yeah. And Cameron Meredith is going off the board at wide receiver 49, 11 two right now. And you know, that's fair right in front of Marquise Lee or big Mike Williams, whatever. So, this to me is more about Smith, who's going undrafted. And here's one of the quotes. And again, this isn't a beat writer. This is in the building. Saints. Uh, kids awesome. Great speed. Unbelievable ball skills in the air. A great second receiver. Okay. <laughs> I've, it got my attention. So now, final pick of your draft, Bloom. Why not Traquan Smith? Or Kiki Cutie or any number. I got a Kiki Cutie reference in there. It only took me about 20 minutes. <laughs> Or any uh, other of these rookies or otherwise some of these receivers that with an injury or maybe even without an injury could get extra opportunity. But I think that we what we've hit on here is talent on the upslip of your career plus good offense, good quarterback can be something in hindsight that we wished we had gotten a piece of. Chat room is reacting and we're kind of doing a little bit of an AMA tonight on the Audible Live uh, Jared says that a copy of Blue Hawaii by Elvis come with that shirt yeah. because it should have. Bloom, your shirt is a hit. This yeah. one, and I think, is one of the most important questions we could possibly have at this time of year. Hmm. Because Andrew chimes in. He says, See, Sig, what are some of the drum beats that really have your attention? Once again, Goodwin is drumming up a storm. Not sure how it gets targets. Oh, he says, Godwin is drumming up a storm. Uh, gets targets, but the Bucks are bananas for him. Yeah, that's interesting. I would say Goodwin, who again we just did the 49ers preseason watch list. Stay tuned for that. Um, you know, there's a drum beat there. This is very important to note when we look at these drum beats and where they're coming from and who do you trust. When Mike Reese says something, we listen every single time. He was on this show years ago, talk about Wes Welker when Welker was added by the Patriots. You know what happened there. So Mike Reese is gold, and there are Mike Reese's in, in most every market. So there are reliable reports, hand-on reports that you could trust. I would bring up Mac Hollins, Bloom, as one of the consistent drum beats that we get. Uh, and it is a little bit sad because Teron, our man Teron Davenport, congratulations on the Titans gig. He was covering the Eagles now. So he covers the Tennessee Titans now. So, yeah, you know, you look for, okay, where's that reliable information? I'm hearing enough about Mac Hollins uh, that I trust that, that I get excited about that. Mike Reese himself talking about Jacob Hollister with the Patriots. Uh, again, you know, we, we talk about that bloom. You guys will hear it in, in just a little bit. But looking for that, watching for that, and knowing where they're coming from. This time of year, the preseason does matter, Bloom, and it matters for that. It doesn't mean everything. The games don't count. You can be a preseason stud and be a total slappy in the NFL. But are we hearing consistent things? Some of your favorite drum beats, do they include Matt Collins, Jacob Hollister, maybe Philip Lindsay? Yeah, Philip Lindsay's for Deep Dynasty, especially. And I some some really smart guy that covers the Broncos has helped me tune into that. But you're not the only one. And that's one of the things we want to see are multiple beat writers, multiple observers, including coaches or teammates talking about a player. I'm gonna do a deep breath here and try to touch on as many of these as I can. And it's not always negative, positive drum beats, too. Sometimes it's negative drum beats. And some of these things, the verdict is still out. These are just sometimes putting things on our radar. Some of them, I feel, are strong enough to take action and change rankings. Some of them, I'm open to changing rankings, and I'm waiting for more. And I'm just going to step through these in my head, division by division. So bear with me, folks. But 
I think one of the first ones is Devontae Parker not really taking that step, not generating the buzz, but it is against Xavier Howard. And it may well be that that's just how Xavier Howard makes everybody look this year. And this is more of an Xavier Howard story, as in, in DFS, et cetera. You avoid Xavier Howard. Week one against Tennessee. Uh, and uh, it, I'm just saying this. I would say take a Miami receiver a month ago. I'd say take Kenny Stills right now. Stills tried to defend Parker in the media. Didn't really win me over. Uh, speaking of Tennessee, Rashard Matthews. Injury lingered for two months. Still working off on the side at something. Or I should say still started working off on the side. That makes Corey Davis and Taewon Taylor, who's also lining up outside, not just in the slot. And hey, week one, Xavier Howard, if he's locking up Corey Davis, Taewon Taylor, big week one breakout against Miami. Maybe. Uh, just know that Andrew Luck is back, and there's not any big stories out of Indy Camp. In other words, he looks like Andrew Luck. He's still scaling back up, still need to take some hits and things like that. Him and uh, T.Y. connecting. Oh, about that again. Same as always. Same as it ever was. Dion Kane, one of those drum beats. Thank you. It's a great. It's one of the first videos I remember watching MTV as a kid. Yes. And uh, I think that Dion Kane is carrying over a drum beat from the spring and should be your favorite to be the number two and maybe also be an important player in the red zone. Kiki Q. Dion mentioned him. All right. Uh, I would say. Looking at Baltimore, Alex Collins is the guy. And we've been telling you to draft him as if he's the guy for a little while now. I know I've been drafting him in the fourth round everywhere I can get him. He's going to be the starter and the lead back in a good offense. And it does sound like also Joe Flacco at least is healthy and may get a little bit of that Alex Smith 2017 bump where you feel the rookie, you feel the pressure, and you ratchet it up a little bit. John Ross. John Ross looks like John Ross. The good John Ross, the top 10 pick John Ross, Brandon LaFell released today. And it said that his representatives have been asking for him to be released. They see the writing on the wall. Cincinnati offense, watch out for that offense to take a step forward as long as Cordy Glenn stays healthy. Uh, stepping through, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with Josh Gordon. We'll see what happens. Antonio Callaway is getting a lot of good buzz, but so is Corey Coleman at times. So that role, whether it's Gordon or Coleman or Callaway, could be very, very interesting. I just saw some really good buzz from Dylan Cantrell. Hey, Matt. Uh, Dil Matt knows a thing or two about Dylan Cantrell. Really, really strong buzz. Maybe not for this year, but down the line for one Dylan Cantrell. Um, Jordy Nelson. And what I like about the Jordy Nelson buzz is the beat writers are even saying, this might sound like fluff. This might sound like the kind of thing, but I'm telling you, he looks quick. He's everything they expected him to be. And I, I would not have expected Jordy Nelson to be a subject of training camp buzz. But there you have it. He is. Uh, I Let's also stay in the AFC West and talk about Sammy Watkins. Because guys that work for the team are, are saying like Sammy Watkins. Teammates saying Sammy Watkins. Beat reporters saying Sammy Watkins. Bloom, I'll save you the breath and uh, you know bring up Sammy. Did you have anyone else before we jump to Matt here? Well, I'll use this to jump to Matt, okay? Because I think one of the most underreported stories in fantasy football right now is one of the stories very early on in training camp. And I, I haven't gotten any good follow-up to know whether there's something to this. But Kareem Hunt last year was just on fire to begin the season. At a certain point during the season, we were wondering whether we should start him. And then he helped us win titles. That was with Charkandrick West, who may not even make the roster as his primary backup. To open camp, Spencer Ware 100% cleared. And Spencer Ware, people may not know this. If you look at Spencer Ware's numbers before his concussion in 2016, they were very close on a per-touch basis to what Kareem Hunt did last year when everyone's raving about Kareem Hunt. I'm not saying that Spencer Ware is going to take over this backfield. I'm not even saying that Spencer Ware is going to get more than 25 or 30% of the touches. But if Spencer Ware gets 25 or 30% of the touches, Kareem Hunt cannot deliver on first round value. Matt Waldman was the one telling us all along, watch out for Spencer Ware. Matt, do you think I'm out on a limb here? No. I mean, I think that when you take a look at that team, uh, certainly it's, it's about the offensive line. It's about the system that they're employing. And it's not that, Kareem Hunt is a bad back by any stretch of the imagination, but at the same time, 
you know, there was a little bit of sometimes we look at players and and think of them as singular entities and not a product of, uh, you know, everything going right or going wrong with that team. I mean, it's like we all know Todd Gurley is a great back and that he's an excellent, you know, that he's one of the top backs in the league. But, you know, it was what two years ago there were legitimate the people were legitimately questioning whether or not he was a fraud as a top back because of the fact they didn't have a good enough offensive line or that, you know, Mike or the, let's see, Le'Veon Bell after averaging less than four yards per carry, people thought that, you know, he wasn't He's a very like Trent good back. Richardson, remember that? That's like yeah. Trent Richardson. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so those are all kinds of things. And I, I think what it was is, you know, I think I, I'm sorry about being late. I got on here. We had a little thing going on here, but it was that, you know, seeing you and then seeing that Steelers shirt that that C, that Cecil's wearing, talking about talking about Josh Gordon. You know, according to the poll that we put out, they all told me to they you know only twenty, I think only like twenty something percent sniffed a terrible terrible towel and said, yeah, it's okay for Bloom to be talking about Josh Gordon. So, <laughs> He's Matt Waldman, there is Sigmund Bloom. I am Cecil Lammy. It is the Audible Live. We're going through the chat room. It's kind of an AMA, and it can be about not football, but it's football season. We got the game on behind me. Uh, Matt, any impressions here before we jump back to the chat room and the questions? Any impressions? Uh, Lamar Jackson, yeah, any hot Gus Edwards insight here as we're watching the first preseason game of the year? You know, it's funny. I hadn't had a chance to watch um, Edwards at all and he looked pretty smooth so that was nice but i had any chance to study him the guy that i did study that i didn't know was on the team was delance um turner who was from i believe it's alcorn state was it alcorn state i think it's alcorn state that he was it, that that i had a chance to see him and so it was interesting to see that he was on that team i was i was just kind of impressed to see robert griffin out there without a brace you know and actually you know looking fairly smooth and fairly quick and he looked a little better than he did in his Cleveland days. That's for sure. Um, you know, so having a year off was probably a really good thing for him. Um, so, so, you know, that was pretty cool, but I mean, it's, it was fun to just hear kind of the roundup from, from bloom with some of the training camp people. And, and, you know, that's another thing you talked about system. I mean, Jordy Nelson's a good example that everyone said that he's too slow and, and you know that he's lost a step but i remember i was watching him this past week and thinking well after you know aaron Rodgers went down all they did was throw curl routes to him or put him in the slot and he was the second option in an offense where you didn't have time to be able for the, the time or a quarterback who was capable to throw to the second option um based on what the situation was so of course his, his yards per carry were going to go down so i mean it's fun to watch players who you know, get a chance to prove that they still have it, you know, and I think so right. this is this is going to be one of those fun situations. Well, opinions can change, things can change, and I will say on the Robert Griffin the Third saga, you know, the way that he handled the Mike Shanahan thing, I don't want to say treated Mike Shanahan, but the way that he handled that was piss poor. It was absolutely terrible, and it caused that rift when you go in uh, you know, with your owner firmly on your side, and you got the playbook, like, I'm not running these plays. And Shanty's like, those are your best plays. And he's like, refuses to run them. But when I talked to Robert Griffin III at the Super Bowl, when he's looking for a job, he just seemed changed. And that kind of leads a segue in Bloom, Matt, as we go through some of the drum beats, which makes me think, Gary, come, come on the kick drum. Come, come. Uh, that's a Wedding Crashers reference, or actually the breakup reference. Sorry, I messed that up. But anyway, Bloom, hmm. who are some of the players you've changed your mind on? Because my own eyes have made me reconsider what I've been saying and thinking and promoting about Emmanuel Sanders. Now, when Emmanuel Sanders, and I talked to him back in like uh, May, whatever it was, April, whatever it was, and Sanders was like, yeah, I'll play the slot if the ball's coming to me. And just kind of had that little bit of attitude. You had heard about, oh, he's still recovering from the ankle. That was some of the things during mini camps and OTAs. Like, oh, Sanders isn't out there. He's still working on that ankle. And then the drafting of Cortland Sutton, the drafting of Deshaun Hamilton. And Cortland Sutton has been, Will Parks called him like LeBron out there. He's, he's not that. But D'Amato Pecco said he's mossing people out there. He is doing that seemingly every day, showing great connection with, with Case Keenum. 
and Demarius is having a good camp. I, this is an anti-Demarius take. But Sanders is blowing it the, you know what, up. Emmanuel Sanders is playing like his hair's on fire. Emmanuel Sanders is way different than what we had expected because of one, his attitude, and then two, because of that ankle. You know, so now all of a sudden, and we can't reveal strategies per Broncos media policy, but it's already been released. Uh, they're putting DT and Emmanuel in the slot. And when I asked Vance Joseph back at the combine, like, hey, we'll you use Demarius like the Cardinals, you Larry Fitzgerald. He said, it's something that we'll consider. Well, we see it now. We see it now. Mm, I can't say how much, but just we see it. We see Demarius used like Emmanuel. Why? Because they're trying to, uh, to use like Larry. Why? Because they're trying to get Cortland Sutton on the field. He is that impressive that early on. And Sanders just is spectacular. Again, pads just came on a couple of days ago, guys. But he's one of those players where I went, okay, it was kind of shaping up to be, oh, Sanders is going to be kind of a bad apple this year, right? Ah, and Sutton and Hamilton, they'll take away and blah, blah, blah. Sanders is just blowing it up. Uh, you know, I don't know what that equals, but there seems to be uh, a trust there, an explosion there that we didn't see last year in the, the clown car at quarterback that the Broncos had. So I'm changing my mind on Emmanuel Sanders, and I look at him now. I think wide receiver 35, roughly his average draft position. I look at that as a value. Bloom, is there someone that you've changed your mind on based on, I, you know, I know, practice AI. Yeah. But is there, is there a, a drum beat that you're like, okay, uh, that wasn't what I was expecting? Well, I'll try to step through the NFC as quickly as I can. Uh, the most important ones, the high points. And I'll try to write up an article soon about the things that are on my mind. Evan Ingram, I was thinking he was going to be fourth in the pecking order and have trouble living up to his ADP based on what he did last year without o Odell Beckham, without Saquon Barkley. But they're actually lining him up as an outside receiver. They're gonna. They're smart. I mean, this is a good sign for the Giants' offense in general that they're saying we need to keep Evan Ingram on the field in any way that we can. And I think Evan Ingram could end up being tight end three and closer to Travis Kelsey than whoever tight end four is. And while we're in the tight end ANFC East talk, Dallas Godert has been getting a ton of red zone looks. He's Jimmy Graham. And look, Zach Ertz's touchdowns went up last year, but his catches and yards didn't. And if his touchdowns go back down what they've been, he's, you know, glorified Kyle Rudolph. So Dallas Goder could be very, very interesting. And Ertz has had concussions and so on. If rookie tight ends making big impact doesn't usually happen, but it could happen with Goder. Jamison Crowder is the Washington receiver you want to own. Of course, he and Alex Smith go along very well together. Like Emmanuel Sanders, like Tyler Lockett was hurt last year. So whatever prejudice you may have against their fantasy stock last year, that wasn't the player that they can be as long as they stay healthy. It's your Randall Cobb, another one who had a cleanup right before camp. And it sounds like from all accounts that hopefully some of the things that have been holding him back in previous years won't hold him back this year. There's some buzz building about carry on Johnson more involved in the passing game. Maybe he gets a chance to be a three down back a little earlier than we think Anthony Miller in Chicago. Everybody is just blown away by this guy. And I would expect him to be a starter for this team. I'm not sure how quickly the fantasy value will come, but it's coming folks. And it should be coming pretty soon. Um, some Jimmy Graham buzz with Aaron Rodgers, but there was a lot of Aaron Rodgers and Martellus Bennett buzz last year. So uh, skeptical, a little skeptical. Um, hearing a little bit about uh, Peyton Barber enough to say slow down on the Ronald Jones Express a little bit, a little bit. Uh, the biggest one, and we've been talking about this in the chat room, and this is one where I'm going to say I was wrong. I was wrong. Pierre Garcon was not the receiver to target for the 49ers. He and Jimmy Garoppolo are still working on their chemistry. It was right there. It was obvious. It was staring us in the face. Garoppolo and Goodwin had tremendous chemistry last year. They signed him to an extension. It has carried over to this year. Multiple observers saying Goodwin's the number one receiver, and he's playing like a number one receiver. And I wish for every time I took Pierre Garcon in a best ball draft, I could have taken Marquise Goodwin instead. And if people are rational, that ADP is going to flip and Goodwin should be ahead of Garcon. And I'm not sure how viable 
Garcon is going to be in fantasy leagues this year. 49ers own version of the G, -G, -G, -G unit. Yeah. Had to get that in. Matt, uh, drum beats that you're listening to that you're paying attention to, or perhaps drum beats from preseason in training camp where you've changed your mind or, or updated an outlook on a player. Yeah, I think Goodwin is certainly one on my list for sure because I saw him as, you know, it's been kind of gradual with him in Buffalo. He just seemed more of an athlete who could catch and run a couple of decent routes, but he wasn't that full-fledged full fledged player that he's really become, and it's happened over the course of time. And so if it's, you know, it's being solidified in camp right now that he is that number one guy that just kind of gives you an idea of what his trajectory has been and that these guys can improve on that level. I thought that Christian Kirk was going to make a little bit more noise early on, and it seems like that that's been a little bit flat um, at this stage. You know, of course, we still have a long way to go and see how that works out, but I thought he would be... I thought he would have a chance to make an impact right away, and I'm starting to think that it will probably be year two before we really get a chance to to see him do his best work, and he may just be more of a sub package player based on what we've seen. Um, you know, working working our way in Cleveland, I really didn't have a. I, I haven't seen it yet for you know, but it sounds like all the buzz is talking about how good Antonio Callaway has been. And I really, and I've heard a lot of people who, you know, talked about Callaway, seeing him as a as a really strong prospect outside of the the things off the field. And when I watched him, I honestly saw what I saw was an intuitive athlete who was who had a lot to learn. But I didn't think that he was a guy that I would say, oh, he's ready right now. I'm interested in paying a little more attention to Traquan Smith. Um, because there were things about him that I was lower on than probably the consensus. And now that he's actually in potentially going to have an opportunity to play early is, you know, th that he's playing well enough to get that type of attention is another positive. Catch, not, not to interrupt there, Matt. Sure. Did you catch Sig and I just talking about Traquan before you jumped on? I don't, I don't know no. if you have a stream up or whatever. I, I have some information um, from the building, not a beat reporter. And I just want to reiterate this for you and get your reaction about Traquan Smith. Kid is awesome. Great speed. Unbelievable ball skills in the air. Great second receiver. Is he the number two opposite Michael Thomas, Traquan Smith? Because there's people in that building that think so. Well, that's that's interesting, you know, because I would have listened to that and still even now because I haven't seen it with my own eyes enough to, to feel comfortable about that. But I would... When I look at New Orleans and I think, well, uh, if they're defining the second receiver as the second outside receiver in that mix, sure, especially when the coach is talking about Cameron Meredith offering the Saints um, an element that they haven't had since uh, Marcus Colston retired. And so when I think of it from that standpoint, my bias wants to think, well, you know, Cameron Meredith may be the number three receiver the way that we define one, two, and three oftentimes by, you know, what position they play. But he's really, he might be the number two um, option in our hearts when it comes to fantasy football <laughs> at that stage. Uh, so I'm, so I'm a little bit more leery of that. And I've, and when I looked at Smith, he, I saw him again as more athlete who had, some inconsistencies with how he goes up to win the ball and and some of the routes that he ran but you know this is the fascinating thing about really rookies entering training camp and Alvin Kamara was a perfect example of of a player who you know recognized the talent but when you look at there are certain flaws that you look at and say you know certain things can wreck people you know David Wilson was a fantastic talent, but he couldn't hold on to the football, and, and it was a big part of his career that was an issue. He also was a guy who did bounce some things outside a little too often because he leaned on his athletic ability. Those were two of the exact problems that Alvin Kamara had at Tennessee. I mean, his ball security was atrocious, you know, at Alabama, at the community college, and at um, Tennessee. And he was one to. He was one to be undisciplined with what he did between the tackles. You would not have known that if you just watch his rookie tape. 
I mean, the guy looked fantastic in, you know, in terms of the discipline of his decision making and the ball security. I mean, it's like he went from, he, he basically went from somebody who carried it like a loaf of bread to, to basically being a half step away from Tiki Barber post Tom Coughlin. I mean, it was, you know, so players can grow very quickly in certain areas. And when they do that quickly over the course of, the you know over the course of a few months that should be an indicator as well that they have that something extra in terms of the ability to learn quickly and to identify what they need to work on and that should be a real positive moving forward so i'm looking forward to seeing a guy like smith because if he's shored up some of the things very quickly that were outstanding in his game in pre-draft then then that's like that should even be like an added bonus to that player because it just tells you how good of a learner he is and th- that mental side of the game that makes him you know a worthwhile guy. I'm watching Lamar Jackson as we're starting this, you know, doing his thing and then you know trying to throw that deeper ball and getting it getting it jumped, you know. So welcome to the NFL. Welcome to the NFL, indeed. Bloom, uh, the chat room wants to know about Michael Gallup. And the drum beats therein. Well, the drum beats are all positive. And I think eventually Gallup can level off and be a fantasy relevant receiver. I'm not sure about the Dallas offense this year. I'm not sure about the Dallas pass offense. Uh, Alan Hearns, Michael Gallup, Tavon Austin is going to play a big role there, I guess. Blake Jarwin. Um, I don't know. I just don't know about this pass offense. I like Dak Prescott, but I'm worried. I'm worried that this pass offense is not going to be difficult to defend with the receivers that they will put out there. So I think that while Gallup year two, year three, may be one of the top three or four rookie receivers from the 2018 class. I'm not sure about this year. If I had a chip to put on someone at the end of my draft, it would be Gallup, although he may lead this team in targets. And if Alan Hearns can't stay healthy, I could eat my words. I want to, I do want to shift gears really quick talk a little bit about what's going on in this game and a larger theme and then toss another topic that I think is a very important topic that is inspiring more vigorous debate than anything else in fantasy right now. First, the big receivers. Remember the draft when all of those big (laughs) receivers fell? Well, look tonight, Javon Wims, seventh round pick, making plays. Auden Tate, I think was a little bit of the reason that Brandon LaFell was released. Auden Tate has been everything the Bengals could have expected and more. It was all John Ross. No. Marcel Aitman is going to make the Raiders as a seventh round pick. So perhaps the NFL overreacted a little bit, uh, letting these big receivers fall. The big receivers that had game, even Alan Lazard is starting to show signs of life in Jacksonville. I'm not sure if he's going to make the team maybe more of a practice squad player. See about Simi Cobbs in Washington, but Josh Dawson's got a heel injury. And where's Dr. Gene? What does it mean when your heel has to be drained? doesn't sound good. That sounds bad. And it all started with Cortland Sutton Bloom. I I mean, I can tie this into the Gallup situation because I watch Cortland Sutton every day and go, what the hell was Dallas thinking? And Leighton Vander Esch is a fine player, but they don't have anybody. Plus, you look at who's going to cover Gallup. If that's a number one corner, Gallup's not doing anything. Matt, you and I saw Gallup at the Senior Bowl, and we saw him. Things kind of get to his head a little bit. We know he can make crazy catches. He's a talented player. But as Bloom's mentioning, these big right, wide receivers are making plays across the league. So here's yeah. the big topic. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Chime in. Yeah. And then up. They are. But at the same time, you know, this is the time of the year where athletic ability reigns supreme in the sense that we're not talking about, you know, heavy diagnosis type of plays, plays where you have to require, you know, a real absorption of the system um, on a level that's going to be a little bit more nuanced and complex. So, you know, part of this is that we're, you know, we're looking at guys who, who are used to making plays and being the kind of the playmaker to rely on that athletic ability. Whereas during the season, we're going to see a lot more of, uh, of the reliance on the, on the nuances of the game that maybe we're not seeing quite right now. That's fair. But if you get a seventh round pick that can make your team period, that's good. It was a good seventh round pick. Sure. And maybe that's the, Maybe that's them getting it right, though, yeah. which is like, you know, these got instead of overvaluing them, we know what they can do and we can exercise that, but we don't have, but that's, that's what it is. So here's the big debate right now, or at least where the emotions are running high in the fantasy community. 
uh, it's the Seattle backfield. And first of all, I still maintain what I said back whenever Rashad Penny was drafted, which was I don't want to invest a first round rookie pick in a Seattle running back. However, speaking of drum beats, boom, boom. Off season, Chris Carson's the most impressive player on the field for Seattle. Thump, thump, thump. First week of training camp, Chris Carson's the most impressive player on the field for the Seahawks. Thump, thump, thump. Chris Carson, as of right now, would be the starter. Thump, thump, thump. Now, CJ Precise, who has always been impressive when he's played, is healthy and also has a very defined role in this offense. So, as it is, you had one of the worst fantasy backfields last year, a th- potential of three-headed backfield, I say stay away. However, and I don't want to speak for people or paraphrase, there is still a very strong sentiment that basically whatever is going on in camp right now doesn't matter. They spent a first-round pick on Penny. Penny's going to be the guy, and Penny is still worth the third or fourth-round pick that people are paying for him in drafts. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the season. I'll set the map first. I mean, are, do you, where do you weigh in on this? Because this seems to be one of the third rail, live wire, hot button issues in fantasy right now. I'm with you. I mean, I don't see, you know, you have to look at the team and the behavior of that team and consider the fact that Mike Mayock just a couple years ago was touting CJ Precise as one of the best backs in that draft class. And he, when he was healthy and he actually got on the field and played as a rookie before he hurt himself, he had a game and a half run where you started to think, wow, okay, he could be taking over. You had Thomas Rawls, who, you know, was a late round pick. And next thing you know, he did take over and he was the guy that was supposed to have that first opportunity. Then you look at, you know, Mike Davis, who comes in later on. And there's what you see is that there's multiple roles for these guys and they, they're segmenting them apart. And the Seattle Seahawks believe in competition, they don't necessarily believe that just because he's a first-round pick means that we're going to force-feed him onto the field right away. We're going to give him an opportunity to compete just like we give the seventh-round guys to compete. Because otherwise, if you look at it, J.D. McKissick would have had no opportunity to have been to make the ball club ahead of Alex Collins as Alex Collins being more of a mid-to-late-round pick, and they cut in Collins. Um, but they, just, they do have that... Let's compete and have an open competition thing with the exception of maybe a few players, you know, a few key players. And and the rest is just like, let's just see how it all kind of unfolds. I mean, that happened with Russell Wilson and Matt Flynn way back in the day with Flynn being the high priced free agent and them signing Wilson go, well, it looks like he's, he's showing something. Let's give him, him an opportunity earlier. So, you know, Rashad and, you know, I don't believe anything that Pete Carroll has to say when it comes to, you know, the media and what he, what he does. I mean, he's just, he's in demeanor. He's the exact opposite of Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick is just kind of like, seems like, you know, like the grumpy Latin teacher who basically, you know, knows every word in the dictionary or in an unabridged dictionary and he could pass it around the room and, show you how smart he is, but doesn't want to really say too much and just kind of scares the heck out of everybody. Whereas Pete just plays the kindly guy who says everything nice that, that, that people think he thinks everyone wants to hear as his way of saying the same exact thing. Shut up. I don't really care what you think. I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be ultra positive and sunshiny about everything. And now you have no flipping idea of what exactly we're going to do unless you actually look at the field rather than create your own narrative. And I want to jump in here and quote one Matt Waldman who came up with the excellent analogy that uh, Pete Carroll's Willy Wonka and Bill Belichick's Slugsworth, of course, doesn't really make as much sense now that I don't think they're on the same level as coaches and organizations. But there was a time that it made sense. No, there we a- have it. Boom. Uh, by the way, just looking at average draft position, Penny's at running back 22, 411. In front of Lamar Miller, Mike Ingram, Sony Michelle, Rojo, Royce Freeman, uh, Deion Lewis, who we talked about earlier. Then you go all the way down to Chris Carson, and he is at running back 43, 907, just right in front of Nick Chubb, Coy Clement, and Naheem Hines. So you do see a difference obviously, in the way that they're drafted. I have a soft spot for Carson. 
I should have a spot, soft spot for Penny Bloom, but I, maybe San Diego State running backs. Uh, maybe I'm burned from Ronnie Hillman. Plus, Carson runs with more violence, which I love and appreciate a power back, as you all know. Uh, and Penny, even though he's a larger back, and Matt, you and I saw him on the All-Star circuit, like, Penny's a daintier runner. At 220, it's not like yeah. he's going to have the power of a 230, 100-pound man, but he looks to make people miss more than looks to run people over. Yeah, and he's, and he's, you know, people talk about yards after contact, and it's funny because I actually had somebody, I brought up, I think I brought up the idea here that they should be tracking something called yards through contact as an idea where if someone actually wraps the back, like gets their hands on them and able to wrap up and either hit, they don't, whether they bring it with a hit or not, if they've actually wrapped the guy up, let's track how many yards they get after that not whether they like just reach for the guy slap him on the leg and then the guy goes for 45 yards because when you count that it artificially inflates whether the guy's really has power and balance at the level that the yards after contact infers but isn't actually true about and so it's interesting because i there's a writer who who contacted me uh, you know recently and was like i didn't i did a study on Penny and Nick Chubb and another back just as a preliminary thing. And he, and he showed how that there was a vast difference between what yards after contact looks like compared to yards through contact. And, and if you actually judge it by that, that definition. And so I think he's going to be doing a lot more research into this in the coming, in the coming months, um, you know, and tracking this kind of information, but it just shows you that, you know, Penny's a guy that, like you said, he is definitely he's a good pass receiver. The blocking element, I keep we keep hearing the positives about that, but you know, I remember people saying that Kareem Hunt was doing fine, just needed to get a little better in pass protection, and then we never really saw him all year, other than you know, in really really easy situations that were like, you know, they were like the kid level of like, you're going to help us cook today, Kareem. Um, you know, you're going to boil water. Just watch the water boil. You, you know, don't you're not going to handle the knives, but just watch this. And when the, and when it gets really hot, just tell Daddy yeah. that the that the water's bubbling up. Don't touch it. Don't don't handle it. Just come over, and you're doing a great job, Kareem. That was the equivalent of his blocking last year. And I have the feeling that you know until we see it in the preseason, the diagnostic aspect of that. There's a reason why CJ Procise is most likely going to be the 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 third down back in this particular package right now, and they using him moving forward is that they they just don't want to say anything bad about a first round pick, especially because of this narrative that people think, oh well, if he's a first round pick, then he's going to play automatically right away. They don't want to say anything like, well, he's not ready, and then the question, well, you had eight million backs, why aren't you playing him right away? So, you know, there's a whole set of PR issues, I think, involved with that as well. I was just going to say San, San Diego State uh, running backs to Nell Pumphrey, maybe back from the dead, maybe. Uh, if he doesn't make Philly's roster, if the reports are accurate and he keeps it up, he'll catch on somewhere. And then another one that I'll toss back to Matt Waldman. Love the boiling water, too. I still can't get that picture out of my head. Um, Jordan Wilkins in Indy. And remember, if Andrew Luck is Andrew Luck, and that means a lot for T.Y. Hilton, but that means a lot for this whole offense. Yeah, it does. And and Jordan Wilkins, I mean, it was fun to to watch him because he's one of those guys that is an example of why it's more important to be quick as a running back and have great stop start change of direction than it is to have top speed because he's. He's got that a Arian Foster speed, but he also has that Arian Foster quickness and yards after contact type of, or yards through contact type of strength and power. And the only thing, he's got terrific vision. He reminded me of a mix of Arian Foster and Matt Forte. And it turns out Chris Ballard of the, of the Colts said he reminded him of Matt Forte as a runner. And when, when you watch him, he does some things that you don't normally see from college backs like make astute cutbacks on purpose on gap plays, which is not something you normally see a guy do, or is it advisable? But he had some rare instances where you could see he knew what he was doing in that situation 
and made a really advanced kind of diagnosis with it. And he, he's one of those guys that with Quentin Nelson being in, you know, playing at guard and really going to have an opportunity to upgrade this offensive lines run game and Andrew Luck being back and the elements that he can provide as a runner. Next thing you know, I mean, they, they talk about this as a, as a committee situation, but it's also, it's also one of those things where, you know, Robert Turbin's just a guy. Marlon Mack is not a, a good decision maker and has to prove that he can that he can advance on that level. So I, I think Jordan Wilkins and Naeem Hines really have a chance to be a nice dynamic duo for this Colts offense within you know by the end of the season. And and they're both the best values on the board. There we have it. It's the Audible Live, ladies and gentlemen. Matt, I made the announcement tonight that you will be in Denver for my draft party. So, oh, man, can't wait. It's going to be great. to uh, seeing you and uh, having a little fun there. We appreciate everyone for watching the show, for participating. The chat room is fired up, and we certainly love the questions tonight. Good seeing all of our guys, Joe and everybody, what's up as football is back. Follow Sigmund Bloom on Twitter, at Sigmund Bloom, Matt Waldman, at Matt Waldman. The show is at The Audible. I'm at Cecil Lammy saying thank you. As always, stay tuned and stay frosty.